Now, one of the cool things about Bayes' theorem is that it illustrates so many concepts that aren't so obvious at first. One of those concepts is that reasoning and knowledge are always about competing hypotheses. No hypothesis can be tested on its own without other hypotheses to compare it to. When an idea is a good idea, it's always at the expense of other ideas that are worse. And this is true for every idea in our brains. Now, the reason this isn't so obvious is because there's some things that just seem like they're correct. But that's only true because we probably learned those things so long ago that we forgot the process. But when that idea was new, we did it by discarding everything else. Take the idea that um, asphalt is black. Now think about when you might have learned that concept. You were probably two or three years old, and you might have played on different surfaces, like um, concrete or brick. But whenever you looked out onto the street, you saw that asphalt was black. You would have been willing to accept anything at the time. Asphalt could have been yellow or blue, but that didn't match the evidence. You always saw that it was black. The thing here was, that idea was new when you were investigating it and you had to use the evidence. Well, science is in the business of doing this. Science is always investigating new concepts and new hypotheses. Take, for instance, if I were to have invented a drug that's supposed to lower blood pressure. Now, I'd have to scientifically test this drug before it could come onto the market. So, when I make the claim that my drug lowers blood pressure, what I'm actually saying is that the reality that my drug is effective at lowering blood pressure exists in a majority of all potential universes. I'm pretty confident in my claim. But my scientific peers don't have to see it that way. In fact, they won't. They'll make the assumption that my drug is worthless. And my new drug has to prove itself. So my colleagues at the Food and Drug Administration are going to challenge my claim by making the assumption that the reality that my new drug is effective is only true in a small number of the universes of all potential universes. That leaves this big region out here where my drug is ineffectual. Science even has a name for this. This region where my drug doesn't work is called the null hypothesis. That's the competing hypothesis that my claim is being tested against. Science always takes a skeptical position after a hypothesis is proposed. A hypothesis must always prove itself. And what's more, science is never 100% certain. There's always a sliver of a doubt. And there's good reason for this. If you look back over the history of science, you'll see that there are thousands of theories that were proposed and tested and well established. And then they were eventually overturned when new evidence came in or when a better theory came along to replace it. So it's always good to be skeptical. And this is especially true in the deepest questions that science asks, like why is there matter in the universe versus nothing? Or how did the organization of the matter come about? Or why are we having this conscious experience as we go through space and time? We may get some answers from science, but it's another thing justifying those answers. But you may be asking, what if I want to know the truth? What if I want to know is, uh, if an idea is correct? Which idea corresponds to reality? Can I have certain knowledge about something? Well, the textbook definition of truth is being in accord with fact or reality. But this turns out to be a very sticky question that has eluded philosophers and scientists and mathematicians for thousands of years, and it's not resolved to this day. One of the problems is this. Think about, think about what happens when you observe something. Let's say you're looking out your backyard, and you see an oak tree. Now, 
you're justified in the idea that there's an oak tree in your backyard. But there's not a tiny little oak tree in your brain. What happens is somehow your brain states are rearranged by the visual data that comes in through your eyes. So your brain changes and we call this possibly a model or a map of reality. So you have this map somehow in your brain that there's an oak tree out there. Now, what that means is that there's possible maps or there's possible mappings of reality that exist. You don't have the real reality. You just have these possibilities. And that's why I keep showing these peas on the plate. Each of these peas contains a map of reality different from the other peas. And when you ask the question, what is the real truth? What is the real reality? What you're really asking is, can we zero in on the one P on the plate that exactly matches reality? Well, when you try to do this, you run smack dab into a messy problem that has eluded philosophers for hundreds of years. You run into the problem of induction. Here, let me illustrate the problem of induction with the classic argument. Let's say you have a theory, and the theory is, all swans are white. Now, how do you go about proving that theory? Well, you start looking at swans, probably. And every time you come across a white swan, it reinforces your theory slightly. But how do you know that you won't eventually come across a black swan one day? So you're never really sure of your theory. Unless, of course, you look at every swan in the universe. But for most interesting questions, that's impractical or impossible. But if you do come across a black swan, you have totally falsified your theory. Now, there's an asymmetry here. You can never really prove your theory true, but you can totally kill your theory if you come across a black swan. Well, there was a famous philosopher and mathematician named Karl Raymond Popper, and he's highly influential in the world of science. And he, this whole idea didn't escape his notice. He was frustrated because he saw a lot of people doing things that weren't really science, but they were calling them science. Two of his pet peeves were was Karl Marx and his theories on economics, and also, Sigmund Freud and his theories on psychology. Karl Popper became convinced that this stuff wasn't real science, that it was pseudoscience. And see, he set about defining what was science and what wasn't, and he called the, the art of defining the, what is and isn't science the art of demarcation. Well, he left us with some good ideas. One thing he noticed is that a lot of these things that he considered pseudoscience were things where you could not falsify the theory. The theory was set up in a way that it couldn't be falsified. Well, in order to do that, you have to make it really broad. It occupies a lot of the peas on the plate. And when you do get evidence, things don't change very much. So, he was right. Whenever you see a theory that can't be falsified, that should raise a red flag, Possibly this isn't uh, science. Science isn't being done here. He did leave us with some interesting riddles and never really solved them. One of them, and it still, it still contains the problem of induction, one of the problems he left is that if you have a theory that's survived falsification, why is it any better than a theory that's never been tested? Well, there's no real good answer to this problem. It gets back into the, pro the problem of induction. I mean, some things are so confirmed that it seems almost perverse to believe otherwise. But take an example that we all consider to be true. Let's say our theory is that copper conducts electricity. Well, this concept has to occupy almost every universe in our plate of conceivable universes. But we better leave a sliver of a doubt. What if you came up with an alternate theory that says copper conducts electricity up till June 24th of a certain year, at which point it becomes an insulator? 
Well, this seems almost nutty. Why would that happen? Isn't that kind of a stupid theory? Okay, yes, it, it does seem stupid, but why? Well, it's because that theory is unnecessarily complex. It has to contain all of the explanation we have for conductivity. Um, the, the theory of uh, quantum electrodynamics, I think, is the, is the correct theory that defines how uh, electrical forces move through a conductor. It has to contain all of that to explain how we have a conductor, and then it has to have additional parts to this theory that explain why, on June 24th of a certain year, everything will just change and it'll stop conducting. So this theory becomes unnecessarily complex. And in the world of science, we prefer simpler theories. Okay, very good. This concept of simplicity is sometimes called Occam's razor, or the law of parsimony. A simple theory is always better than a more complex theory if it explains all the evidence equally well. Well, why do we have this concept of simplicity or Occam's razor? Well, the only justification we have for that is that it always has worked well in the past. But who's to say it might not change some point in the future? The idea that it always worked well in the past and won't change in the future is sort of an inductive argument. So we're justifying Occam's razor with induction. So this whole thing gets pretty circular pretty quickly. Well, it's real fascinating to go deeper into this. I'd love to show you, and I might in a future video, how philosophers have tried to dig our way out of this conundrum. But it's a little off the subject. In the meantime, please t tune into the next couple videos on Bayes' theorem. A lot more really interesting concepts fall out. I think you're going to find this stuff spectacularly fascinating.